Welcome to the Fury Theory Podcast, brought to you by EFB Advocacy. EFB means excellent for business. The EFB actually means John Easton, who's on the show. Adam Belmar, who is in the production booth today. And of course, I'm John Fury. Uh, we are we have two really important returning guests, great friends of the Fury Theory Podcast, great friends in life, great friends of EFB. We have Meg Hauk of so many different things. She worked for Mitch McConnell. She worked for George Bush. She has her own incredible firm, and she's one of the most significant and important people in Washington, D.C. when it comes to health care policy. But she's here to talk about baseball. And we also have Gail Osterberg, who uh, also worked on the Hill for many years, we used to work at the Motion Picture Association, uh, one of the most talented communications professionals I have ever met in my entire life. But now she's doing communications for a small little library called the Library of Congress, which has the largest library in the history of the world. Is that right? It is. It is the largest library in the world, John. That's true. Which would mean the history of the world, because I can't think of any library in history that would be bigger. I think that's probably right. And we could probably make the supposition, because we are at the Fury Theory Podcast, and we have lots of theories, that it is the largest library in the universe. So let it be disproven. Right? Let I don't think it will be. Yeah. Call in. Call in. <laughs> Excellent point. <laughs> so uh, as you can see from my uh, uniform here, my uh, Washington Nationals uniform, I was looking for my White Sox uniform, but I couldn't find it. I'm not wearing a full uniform, just the jersey. <laughs> Disappointing. Um, that we are having. <laughs> it, would be, it would be fantastic. Um, that we are having a special version of the Fury Theory today where we are talking some politics, but mostly about baseball. So let's get to the theories. Theory one. If you build it, you will come. Yes, if you build it, they will come. The Library of Congress has a wonderful exhibit called Baseball Americana, which was dreamed up. I'm going, this is my theory, and to have someone else disprove it, that this was Gail Osterberg's idea. I'm sure that a lot of other people thought it was their idea, but you know we all know it was Gail because Gail <laughs> yes. is the communications director for the universe's largest library, and uh, we have all of this now baseball Americana at the Library of Congress. The exhibit opens tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, June 29th. And what can you tell us about this unbelievable exhibit at the Library of Congress? I'm pretty excited about it, and um, thank you for your kind introduction. It's probably true there are a number of people who uh, thought about showing baseball items at the library, but we really worked hard to make this a -a one-of-a-kind presentation for folks. We have some great partners who are heavy hitters in the world of baseball, including <laughs> including Major League Baseball and the ESPN Stats and Information Group, as well as the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. So we have items that we have borrowed, we have content that was created especially for this exhibit, as well as items from the library's collections. So it's a real once in a lifetime opportunity to see some of these things exhibited together for the first time. There are items that have never been exhibited in a major way before, and there's content that's been created just for this occasion with ESPN and the library. So it's a really exciting story about not just the history of baseball, but really what baseball means to communities across America. And Meg, you went to the press conference I yesterday. Did. I did. What was did. your impression of what you've seen so far? And even any special questions for Gail? Well, it was amazing. I um, I was so impressed with the, just the way that it's all presented. Just even when you walk in, there's two TVs there that show you sort of the similar views of things then and now. So kind of walk-off hits from 50 years ago and from last week. And it just gives you this view of kind of the consistency of baseball and what it's meant across the past, you know, decades of, of mm-hmm. time in America and how it's been such an important part of people's lives. So um, it's beautifully done. And there's some interactive parts, and uh, you can sort of take a picture of yourself with your own baseball card. Then oh, and now, okay. I highly recommend that. You get a, not a just for kids. Card for not just for kids. Um, <laughs> the librarian was doing it when uh-huh. I wanted to do it, oh. and it felt rude to elbow her out of the way. I don't know. You're, so you're pretty big hitter. Yeah, yeah, no but yeah. So now, who is the librarian of Congress now? Now, and her name is Carla Hayden, and she's in her second year. 
That's right. Uh, in September, it'll be her two-year anniversary. This is the first major exhibition to open under her leadership. Mm-hmm. And now, it's, is she a baseball fan? Big baseball fan. Is she a White Sox fan? She um, actually was a Cardinals fan, oh, okay. um, and then she did become a Cubs fan. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, going to Chicago. Then she moved to Baltimore. She ran the Baltimore library system for a long time and was an Orioles fan. And I think, um, you know, I think she's warming to the to the Nats now. I'm, I'm doing a little bit of lobbying in that regard. So, so she's we're gonna, coming around. We're going to talk a little bit more about the exhibit. Let's talk a little bit, before we get to that, let's talk about loyalty. And at what point can you transfer your loyalty from one team to another? What do you think, Gail? I mean, how long? what's your favorite team? I mean, it's a really good question. And um, another friend of the podcast, Carl Hulse uh, of the New York Times, did a really wonderful piece a few years ago about the Nationals coming to Washington and how difficult it was for everybody who had been longtime devoted fans of their favorite <coughs> team. In his case, I believe it was the White Sox. And uh, and just, you know, the, the process no, he, of... Sorry, Carl's a, a Cubs fan. Oh, he's a Cubs yeah, fan. I sorry, know. sorry. So that's a really, that's a bad faux yeah. pas. I apologize, yeah. Carl. Um, <laughs> but um, if you're but, listening, but, if you're listening <laughs> I apologize. Call, call in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> call in right now. Express some outrage. Um, but it was about how, you know, the, the process of transitioning and realizing, oh, there's this new team. I'm going to just, I'm just going to go because I love baseball. I'm going to just go check out this team we have here. And yeah. then a year or so goes by and you sort of realize, oh, I, I, I hope they do well. And you're kind of cheering, and you start to feel like, am I cheating on my team? And it was, you know, it was a really a tough thing for those of us who had been devoted fans elsewhere sure. to then realize, oh my goodness, I am a full blown Nats fan now. So John Easton, you're from Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, Seattle's close by, but what, when you were growing up, what was your team? Uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Oh, okay. But I mean, it really was. If if we didn't have a pro team, we had the, obviously the Portland Trailblazers, but. Well, that's, have, that's basketball. Well, I know, but I'm saying if you don't, <laughs> if you didn't have a pro team, you had to go. You had it, typically for me, it was south. Uh, I would never. Sorry, Seattle people, I would never go north uh, to you guys. But I think it's a fascinating subject, and and I have a lot of theories on this. But I'll just lay down one real quick, and that is, it's more of a principle, and that is, I think if you grew up somewhere like you did, and all of us did, and you had a hometown team, and you're going to be loyal to them forever, I I get that. It's the kids that are born here. It's your kids. I think you need to give them a fair shot at the home team where they were born. Yeah, you've said that, and I, uh, I, I, I respect I, I feel strongly about that. I know you do. Uh, my wife is getting really tired of hearing this over and over and over again uh, because you do run into it a lot where you have kids who are actually born in Washington, D.C. Their parents were from elsewhere, and they're fans of their parents' team. I don't buy it. I don't like it. Well, I have eclectic sports loyalties because um, I'm sort of not from anywhere, as you all know. My dad was in the Air Force, so um, born in Japan, not a big baseball um, team from there that plays in the major leagues. Um, (laughs) And so my dad was a Cleveland Indians fan, and so we were sort of that family in major league that sits in the outfield with the teepee and the the drums and and the disappointment. Um, (laughs) But we... uh, we moved around a lot and kind of stuck with that once we came here. Went to the O's, but it wasn't ever like, you know, it didn't stick like the Nats. And once the Nats came, that, yeah. that was it for me. Yeah. Um, although not baseball, football. My nephew's decided he's a Cincinnati Bengals fan. He's 10 and he likes Tigers. So I'm hoping to beat that out of him. <laughs> I feel like that's a really appropriate reason to yeah. like a team. Tigers. I love Tigers myself and, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I endorse his loyalty. <laughs> I don't really love Tigers that much. I mean, you know, they're fine, but yeah. I mean, they, well, you're they're, not they're a ten, quite, they're actually you're quite not a, dangerous. You're not a 10-year-old boy. That's good. That's well, good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so let's go to your exhibit. What is the favorite, what's your favorite exhibit in the exhibit? What's your favorite thing that you have in the exhibit that mm. you think everyone should see first? Well, I have a few, but probably the marquee item is this wonderful group of documents that has come to be known as the Magna Carta of Baseball. These are documents that date to 1857, and it was a convention that was held in New York when all of the different ball clubs from around the Northeast came together because they were all playing by different rules. They were playing till 21 runs. They were playing with eight people or 11 people, and they decided, you know, we should get together and come up with a common set of rules that really unifies this game across the region. And these documents were written at that time. They are literally the founding documents 
of baseball as we know it today. It is where they decided there would be nine innings per game and nine players fielding a team and the distance between the bases and where they started calling home plate home plate. So it's a really extraordinary group of documents that previously their significance hadn't really been known. They were held by a descendant of one of the participants from the New York Knickerbockers who tried to auction them in 1999 and nobody was really interested. And um, they recently went up for auction and were sold for millions of dollars. And the the private citizen who purchased them just as a huge baseball fan um, has loaned them to the library for this exhibition. It's oh, the first great. time they've been displayed in a, in a major way. So they did not get displayed in the uh, Hall of Fame. Correct. That's fascinating. That is fascinating. When they were first sort of shared with the public by this descendant in the late 90s, the Hall of Fame actually turned them down. <laughs> So, um, but we're really excited to have them um, on loan at the Library of Congress for the next year during the life of this exhibit. I can't tell you. And so this is, uh, what is this? This is the... This is actually the exhibition uh, brochure, and it features a, um, an image that is from um, a Cubs game, a Cubs program from the 20s. And we really loved it. We thought it was just a really colorful, fun image. And if you open that up, it opens up into a full-size poster which I think is really great. We all like posters. Everyone loves a nice poster, yep. suitable for framing. Mm -hmm. um, just a really nice keepsake. So um, this was one and of that's the- That's opening day, what year? I believe it's 1927. Well, it doesn't say wow. it's opening day for the Library of Congress. Oh, right, 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 right. And I will say one other thing, just because my favorite part of it is there are um, documents, letters between uh, Branch Rickey and Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. um, which are just fascinating to read, like the support that Branch Rickey gave to Jackie Robinson and the influence that he had in Jackie Robinson's life and, and bringing him in and supporting him throughout his career. So it's, it's, it's worth seeing and spending some time there. Uh, any final thoughts on this segment? Because I, I, I want everyone to go see uh, this exhibit. I'm going to go see the exhibit. I can't wait to see the exhibit. I love uh, the whole game of baseball. That's why we have the special Fear Theory edition uh, of, of, of this baseball edition. Um, so we're excited to see it. Um, uh, theory 2. <laughs> Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. There's also no crying in politics. Um, I want to dive down into two subjects in this theory. The frustration that I feel towards my baseball teams, especially the Chicago White Sox, but also the Washington Nationals, and then the frustration that the Democrats must feel about the fact that Anthony Kennedy is retiring. Um, you know, uh, Meg, um, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the Washington Nationals. Um, and there's a lot of Jason Worth haters out there. Yes, I am not one of them. I happen to be a, a very large Jason Worth fan. I thought that Jason Worth brought a lot to the table. I know that maybe in his last year here, he didn't put up the same numbers that he did earlier on, but I also think there's something to be said for being a clubhouse leader, and there's some there, we are missing some unity in our clubhouse right now, and I think you, you, don't, you don't see it as much when you're doing great and on a winning streak. You see it more when you almost get swept by the Phillies. Uh, you know, Washington is a town that has had this real belief that it's never going to win a championship. And then the Capitals win. We've been talking a lot about the Capitals here on the Fury Theory. Uh, and they win. And you think that would kind of inspire the Washington Nationals, uh, John Easton. But they're playing like dog crap. Yeah, for the last you know, week or so. I, I think two. that... Okay, maybe two. I mean, I thought that the last game against the Phillies at home, they played, they put everything together. They played really well. Uh, I think that they're still trying to piece together, you know, that 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 true lineup. There's just a lot of band aids in there, so I don't think the chemistry is quite right. And I actually, I really agree with 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 Meg. I, I've always thought of Jason Worth as you know somebody who is it was sort of a glue in there. At, what, what Ryan Zimmerman? He he had a great quote. He said. That Jason Worth was the kind of, he, he's the kind of guy member of your team who will who will bitch and moan about the copier being broken and be the real thorn in the side of management and but but and then they fix it and all the players are happy 
You know, everybody in the organization's happy because of what that one player did, and that's Jason Worth. And I think that's exactly right. And and to your point, I hadn't really thought about is there a a missing um, sort of cohesive element there in the clubhouse that could be true. You have you know somebody like a Bryce Harper who is uh, kind of too cool for for that yeah. his persona. You have got uh, Anthony Rendon too laid back for that. Mm-hmm. Ryan Zimmerman, well, the guy's injured, and it's kind of tough to be a leader when you're constantly sort of on the on the injured reserve. So who is our, our clubhouse leader? It doesn't have to be a leader in stats, to your point. It's right. got to be kind of your soul. So who is right. that? Well, I, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I do think that they miss him in that regard, and I also think, to your point about the lineup changes, this team seems like it's just been subject to injury yeah for the last several years, and that's not unique to the Nationals, but when you're losing key members of your lineup like Zimmerman, like Daniel Murphy, um, it really does, I think, make it difficult to find a lineup that is consistently working for you. And I think they've managed to do pretty well for the most part. Um, And I, I think it's, you know, I think it's a slump. It's a long season and you see teams, you know, experience ups and downs over 160 plus games. And, and it happens to coincide with Bryce Harper's slump. Yeah. Too. And I and I do think there is an argument to be made that as Bryce Harper goes, our team goes. He may not be the clubhouse leader, but when he's on fire, I feel like we're more much more on fire as a team. Well, we finally got Daniel Murphy back. He's starting starting to get right. his act together. Yep. But uh, you you make an excellent point about Jason Worth. I remember Worth's kind of big leadership was getting rid of Matt Williams when he stood up mm-hmm. to Matt Williams got rid of, he was kind of a terrible uh, coach, I thought, terrible manager. Um, Meg uh, and Gail, let's talk a little bit about uh, the new manager versus Dusty Baker. You guys were all a little bit not sure if Dusty Baker getting fired was a good idea. Do you still think that's right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that I, – I don't know that – I don't know what he would have done had he stayed, but um, I, I, st- I, I feel like I'm – I'm I'm not I'm not ready to give up on the new guy, right? Like I I still feel like we're in a good place. I like the fact that that we keep changing the lineup. I like the okay, let's see where we are now. I I I like him bringing up new talent in in Soto and some of these other guys and giving them a shot, you know? I mean, I, I I think that he's willing to try whatever it takes. And and you know, we, even with Harper in his slump, he's he puts Harper in different spots in the lineup to say, okay, well then try it here, see where you are here, and I, I appreciate that. So go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I agree with everything that Meg said. I think that he's um, dealt with some of these injuries in a great way. We've got some great, exciting new players that he's brought up and is trying different things and has handled some of this stuff. I think about as well as you could. So talking about leadership, talking about being a manager, I want to switch over to politics because this is the Fury Theory, and we talk a lot about politics. One manager that everyone loves to hate but is indispensable to the team is Mitch McConnell. And, Meg, you worked for Mitch McConnell. I'd like the record to reflect that I love to love him. I do not love to hate him. (laughs) Well, I only say that because Mitch McConnell's um, approval ratings are lower than any other leader, lower even – lower than Nancy Pelosi's. And I, and I think that's because he's the only guy willing to say no. Mm-hmm. And he says, no, you're not going to do this. And he, what he injects into the body politic is realism. And there's nobody who's realistic about anything anymore in politics. And so people don't want to hear the truth. We can't handle the truth, to quote another movie, right? Yeah. Um, so t- talking about, talk about Mitch and how he feels now, Senator McConnell. I don't mean to call him Mitch. You can... You can. Um, Senator McConnell and how he feels about this latest retirement. Well, I will say he um, I say this a lot. He has two superpowers. One of them is he is not made uncomfortable by silence. (laughs) And so he will sit there and I've watched it and people just tell him everything he wants to know because they are made uncomfortable by silence. And um, and also he legitimately does not care if you don't like him. And people all the time say, oh, I don't care if you don't like me. And that is not true. He really, he's like, oh, you don't like me? I'm devastated. Anyway, um, <laughs> and so that's for him, he's, he, this, this Gorsuch situation is a good example. You know, a lot of our members got cold feet when he said, we are not filling this seat. Yep. And then they got nervous and hey, we, maybe we, may, you know, Mitch, maybe we need to do something. And he said, no. And then after Gorsuch was confirmed and then it was, you know, it turns out that was a good idea. And he's like, 
Yeah, no, I know. Um, and so I think for him, um, yesterday I laughed a lot of Twitter was the was the pictures of him where he gets that little smirky smile. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think for him, he's a he's a he's a judiciary guy. People who think that what we do in Washington doesn't matter don't realize that for him, we have we have confirmed about a third of the federal bench over the last year and a half since since Trump has been here. That go, is go go Trump tra go Mitch. That is transformational in right. terms of the country and sort of the long term view. If that's what you care about, right. and for him, he does. He doesn't like an activist court. His view is: if you want to make laws, then you should run for office. If you want to interpret laws, then you should then then go be a judge. And so he he's. I, I mean, I can tell you, he's he's over the moon right now. So John Easton, you're a Senate hack. I mean that in the best True. sense of the I know you do. Because um, I love the Senate, even though I'm a House guy. Do you? Do you? Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, 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 I'm going to love the Senate more when Just they like get, I love yeah. the House. <laughs> we all love each other. That's how we, that's how we roll. Uh, what are your thoughts on what's going to happen over the next three months in the United States Senate? Uh, it's Anything? Yeah. Oh, you mean in, other than the nomination? What I'm talking about is how are the Democrats going to react to this, uh, they're going to try to do the McConnell rule, which was you can't have a hearing, you can't have, do anything. Yeah. In, a a, in a presidential year. That's over. Right. I mean, I, I think they can squawk about that all they want, but you know, I, I think uh, Senator McConnell and, and fellow Republican senators are saying, well, he meant that in a presidential year. Over. Next question. I mean, I don't think that that – you can talk about it all you want, but I don't think it's going to really have any traction. I think the larger question is – um, you know, the Democrats have, I think, already showed where they're going on this, and they're going to abortion, you know, Roe v. Wade, saying that, that basically this, this, this seat is about abortion. Are they going to make it about these very, very divisive social issues, and they're going to try to put uh, the, you know, perhaps more moderate senators, Republican senators, you know, in that vice of, well, you know, if you're, if you're going to support this, this person, well, you know, we're going to boycott everything you do and we're going to take you down kind of thing. So I think it's, it's pretty, this pick is pretty critical. If he, if, if, if President Trump nominates a Gorsuch like, you know, real steady legal mind, extremely accomplished uh, academically and through, through the, on the bench, I don't think he's going to have a, a, a really difficult path. Uh, but if it, the, obviously, the more conservative right wing it gets, the, the, the more borkish this gets. So we'll see. Gail, I know that you are no longer a Senate communicator, although you always have that in your soul because you spent so many years doing that. And I, I know in your official role, uh, you can't really say too much about the politics. But um, – just talk about the communications of all this and, you know, how would you communicate if you're um, not President Trump because he's in his own kind of – it's hard to get him to communicate in any kind of – Consistent way. Consistent way, <laughs> um, rational way, I would, I would say. But if you're, if you're a Senate leader, you know, how do you communicate on this and, and is there any way that this will happen after the election, do you think? Mm. I mean, I suppose anything is possible, but I think that part of the communications aspect when it comes to nominees really is that we need to have a fully functioning government. These are key positions. You need to have them filled and you, because they have a very important role to play. So you don't want to spend a period of time with an absence on the bench. You want to get it filled and you know, depending on who that is, um, you know, that would be an important part of, of I think what the argument should be. So uh, a friend of mine was walking through the um, Senate atrium about 30 minutes ago, and there were a lot of people protesting, saying they wanted uh, no more ice. They want to get rid of ice. And as I tweeted out, you know, what does that do to my vodka tonic? Um, <laughs> I just had to get a joke out there. Um, uh, when it comes to c emotion and crying, is it appropriate to ever cry in politics or in baseball, Meg? Well, I, I, I think that's the problem, right? Where we are is in this very emotional place that's, but, but my feelings, you know, I feel mm -hmm. this way. And, and you know, it's, it's, it, that's not how we legislate. That's not how we make these decisions. And I think, um, you know, 
the Democrats, I think, made a pretty strategic error changing the filibuster rules around nominations. And at the time, McConnell said, I think the Democrats will come to regret this and probably sooner than they think. And, and, and you know, they changed it for cabinet secretaries and judges leaving the Supreme Court. And McConnell did change it for the Supreme Court, begrudgingly, because I don't think that he really would, wanted to do that. But when they started to filibuster Gorsuch, then it was... I think that was a strategic mistake for them because Gorsuch is a qualified judge. And that's the question is when we start to get into, to your point, what's, what, how are you going to rule on this case? Hypothetically, mm -hmm. how would you rule on this case? I don't want a Supreme Court judge who's going to answer that question on the left or the right. You want someone who's going to say, I don't know how I would rule on that case. What's the case? What is before me? I don't know what the facts are. I would need to know that first. I, I want someone non-emotional in that case. I want someone who's going to rule by law. You know, and I think that's a great point. And, and I think that uh, if the senators are really doing their job, and, it, and that's both sides of, of the aisle, they're going to get the best legal mind possible. At least Trump needs to nominate the best legal mind he can. And I think that, that so far the short list that we're looking at, we have no idea if these are actually a real short list or not, but they're pretty heavy hitter mm -hmm. legal minds right right now. And what you want and what the Democrats are, are saying we should have is somebody who will stand up to the president if there's a constitutional crisis, if, if he pardons himself or, or, or one of these issues. Okay, well, then the best thing you can do is try to get that person with the uh, judicial temperament and the legal background, sure, study all the cases that they've ruled on and, and make sure that there's a consistency of, um, of, of thought there and, and the way they apply the law so that you can have that confidence. But it's going to go so far beyond that. Now that the politics we're in, we're in I, I, was, I was just studying a little bit ago about the Bork nomination, and, and the Reagan White House was actually stunned by the blowback of, of Bork and of, of the nomination itself, and, and they didn't respond to the charges against Bork for two and a half months. Now, I mean, 1987 is, is an eternity from then to now. That would never happen in this day and age. In fact, already I see the McConnell allies tweeting out lots mm -hmm. of stuff. And, of course, the, 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 they've already, the Trump folks have already gone through one nomination. They're ready. They know they're ready to go. They know what they're doing. But, and, John, I think to your point about, about crying and emotion, it does seem like we are in a particularly heightened place in terms of emotion. And I'm not sure, you know, I think it probably is due to a lot of factors, social media, you know, television images, those kinds of things. But it is not, that is not a new thing. We used to talk about legislating by anecdote when I was in the Senate, because you would find someone that had a particularly compelling story that tugged at the heartstrings. And you could sell legislation based on that as an example. And what you hope will happen, whether you're talking about a nominee or an important piece of legislation, is that there will be people on both sides of the aisle who really are very thoughtful in their approach to the situation at hand they look at the facts that you have communicators and lawmakers on both sides that are sharing mm -hmm. the details and information, getting the facts out so that people are able to make informed decisions. So, Meg, I'm going to make one last attempt to connect these two. Yes. Um, uh, Mitch McConnell is a huge baseball fan. Yes, he is. His his, his memoir is called The Long Game. Well, that's what I was going to say. And a national. Beat, sorry, I'm beat sorry. Me to the point. He's a Nationals fan, He too. is a Nationals fan. Yeah, let's put that he, out there. He's got this. It's called The Long Game. Yes, and that's where the Senate and baseball are connected. Mm -hmm. They're both long games. They are. And they take, they take patience, not only long games, but long seasons. That's right. And um, so talk a little bit more about Mitch McConnell. And you, you kind of stole my punchline, but I'm glad I'm you did. I'm sorry. We're on, that means we're on the right <laughs> – we're yeah, on the we're, same, we're, same, yeah, same wave. We're, we're together. <laughs> uh, so, you know, talk about the long season in baseball and the long season in the Senate and how that's connected. Yeah, I if mean, there is connection. I, I think there is connection, and I think you know he views that that way. I mean, he's you know people always talk about him being a strategic genius, and he is. And you see it working with him, and also just being around him. You realize he's already thought five steps ahead of you, and so while you're over here saying you know we should do this, he's already moved past that and knows where he wants to end up. Um, and and so I think that for him. Some of these things are, 
you know, that's fine. There's a short-term price to pay. But he's willing to move through, he was willing to move through the short-term pain of the Merrick Garland pressure to get to, we're going to win this election, and we're going to get to nominate a Supreme Court justice, and that's going to matter. And I, I think about that in the context of, you know, Democrats are playing them. They, they want this thing to go past the election. But, you know, if the Republicans pick up four seats in the Senate, which I think they will, I know that I'm in the minority on that, but I, th- I actually don't. You're not, and you're not in my minority on that. That's excellent. Well, we are once again yeah, together. We are it's awesome. We're like, yeah, we're totally um, in sync. I, I will say that that makes it easier for us. We can pass even more. We can get even more conservative justice. So I think the okay. Democrats seem to be playing this. They seem to be playing a short game based on emotion. Yes. Not a long game based on strate- strategy. And I think about that in the context of baseball, where you have, you know, sometimes you're not, not going to win that game. Sometimes you're going to get shut out. Sometimes you're not going to have. Right. You're not going to. You don't want to put your starters in and have them, you know, pitch, you know, 130 pitches each game and get tired out by the time you hit August. I mean, I think that was the problem with Dusty Baker going back to Dusty. Yeah. Uh, kind of overworked his pitchers. So. <laughs> well, I also think that the, I think I I do think that the Democrats are um, a few years behind us in the ter- in terms of their their fringe just cannibalizing their party. Um, you know, we had the Tea Party going back to 10 and 12 and and in our you know in our senate races where we were running witches and legitimate rape candidates and <laughs> and they now have we have a client who she calls said, it she said she wasn't a witch yeah oh, that she had a press <laughs> conference to say she wasn't a witch which my friends who are communications people tell me you don't have a press conference no. to repeat the allegation so i don't know no. um but but they have we have a client who's, who calls it their herbal tea party that their far left is just like you know that you look at the Crowley situation, and I mean they are they are getting their fringe taking over, mm-hmm. and so they are doing what we did, which is respond to the immediate, and the immediate is people in the atrium screaming at them. Nice, and, and I will say this um, to Joe Crowley, and I tweeted this out. Um, not that I tweet a lot, but I did tweet to Joe Crowley. He's a fun guy to have a Guinness with. And that my tweet got picked up on some left wing newspaper as evidence that Joe Crowley is like. The, in beh- beholden to a bunch of lobbyists. I never lobbied Joe Crowley. I, don't, I just had beers with him. Um, but anyway, here's to you, Joe. Sorry you lost. Um, so I've I've got another quick baseball nexus okay, here with here baseball go. and and very very raw divisive politics that we are enduring, aren't we? I mean, I think it's pretty bad right now. So um, there was I read a quote recently. I think it was out of a George Will column that he, who who said that the late uh, Bruce Catton, he's a, he's, he was a Civil War historian, said that baseball uh, was the greatest conversation topic America has ever produced. And if you think about that for a second, if you're with your neighbors, especially here on Capitol Hill, but, or, or Portland, or wherever, but if you're with your neighbors, do you really want to engage on a conversation of immigration or net neutrality or, or some of these other uh, uh, less than... Uh, you know, amiable topics. No, you, if you if you can get this thing to baseball, yeah, that's a safe place. It's a safe place, and it's a Thank fun you. place. So, I salute you, Gail, for uh, helping this exhibit get off the ground. Maybe we can have more conversations about baseball and come together. Maybe just a little bit. More. Okay, so that gets me to theory three. We love baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. That was one of my favorite ads growing up. I still love it. I think it gets to what America is all about. Maybe not Chevrolet, but, you know, I like Chevys. Why not? Um, but baseball, I like hot dogs. And apple pie. Who doesn't like apple pie? Everyone, no loves, one. Apple pie. Everyone loves apple no pie. Everyone loves apple pie. So let's dive into America's pastime. And, John, you know, you talked about this uh, as part of the Civil War. And baseball started, right, Gail, right before the Civil War, right? Actually, that is not true. Um, baseball, uh, the, well, we mentioned the document, the founding rules of baseball as we know it were created just before the Civil War. That's correct. 1857. But, but baseball, uh, contrary to conventional wisdom, was originally played in Europe. Some of the earliest known, <laughs> known written descriptions of playing baseball with a ball and a bat and running around. Um, you sure that's bases. not Irish hurling? <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think so. But um, nice try. But, yeah, yeah, right. But in the 18th century, so but it is certainly certainly developed and been refined and perfected here in America. So it's a very American. Um, it, the way that we know it today is a very American um, sport. 
And um, Meg, you grew up in Japan. When did you guys leave Japan? Uh, we were Japan, Turkey, and Germany, so moved to the States uh, in the early 80s. But uh, how old are you when you guys uh, left Japan? Uh, four and a half. Four, so you don't remember. but I, A little bit. A little bit. So they play a lot of baseball in they Japan. They do. Mm-hmm. And we have this, uh, what's his Otani from Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, great yep. base- Now he's one of the great baseball yep. guys. So it's now an international sport. It is. You, they, do they play baseball in Turkey? Uh, I do not believe so. I oh. think they mostly try to stay alive in Turkey right now. <laughs> <laughs> stay away. So, um, but baseball is a quintessential American sport. Um, and when was the first game you went to? Well, we used to come home uh, every summer and go to Pittsburgh and to and to Erie. And my grandfather would take us to Cleveland Indians games, and um, we would go sit in. The- was that Municipal Park? It was uh, in. Uh, no, it was. Um, uh, uh, Oh my gosh! Why can't I think of the name of it? Is it the, a trick question? The one before, the veterans. No. No, I'll I'll think of it and then tell you. Uh, John, what was the first baseball game you ever went to? I believe the first professional baseball game I ever went to was I don't know if you all remember this, the California Angels. Right. Uh, are they? Yeah, they're the Los Angeles Angels now. So they were the California Angels and then the Anaheim Angels and then the Los Angeles Angels. So it was a California Angels game, but I think the second was uh, the first Washington Nationals game at RFK Stadium. Oh, wow. My God. That's wow. incredible. Yeah. So, uh, Gail, what was the first baseball game you ever went to? The first professional baseball game I ever went to was to see the Kansas City Royals hmm. when I was in school at the University of Kansas. We did not have a professional team in Oklahoma where I grew up. Um, and this is the thing about America, right? I mean, you have only certain cities have, like, I'm from Chicago. We have two two teams, uh, Chicago White Sox. My first game I ever went to was the Chicago White Sox. Um, I remember what, we played the, actually the Cleveland Indians, uh, and uh, I was four and a half, five years old. Um, I remember it because I got sunburned. We were sitting, in, and I, but I had a great time. Um, and everyone was so big, mm-hmm. and so loud, and so drunk. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of scary, but you know, it was it was, it was kind of fun. Um, and but there are certain parts of America where you know you would only listen to baseball. Uh, on the radio. And so you have, like, you know, you have, like, the Cardinals fans. Um, you, they, they had they had baseball. You had the Chicago Cubs fans. And, they, and all the South would um, listen to baseball um, uh, through the radio. And so I think that, that is, is fascinating. What is the greatest game you've ever been to, uh, Gail? What's the, the most fun, the most memorable game you've ever been to? Oh, certainly um, Max Scherzer's first no-hitter at Nats Park. Mm-hmm. Um, that was an amazing, amazing experience to sit there. And I'd never ha- considered what that was. And suddenly around the sixth and seventh inning, this crowd starts to get quiet because nobody wants to talk about it and jinx it. And it kind of took me a second to realize what was happening. And then I did. And then the eighth inning, everyone's just holding hands and <laughs> clenched fists. And, you know, every single um, pitch is you're holding your breath. And then when it finally happens, it was just, I mean, it was the most amazing feeling. It was really incredible. Meg, what's the best, most memorable game you've ever been to? It was probably that game we Same were game. together. Um, also, we went to the the uh, eighteen inning game that we were, and we stayed the whole time. Good for you, we were freezing by the end. I have to say. And you was, know, the worst thing about yeah. that game was they stopped serving beer after the seventh inning. Not not in the club level. Just oh so you God! Know. Oh. Also, Jacobs Field. I just 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 came Did to you all Jacobs hear Field. that? Not in the club level. Yeah. <laughs> not in the club. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. Do you know okay, what they did cent? stop selling was warm things to wear in the shop because yeah. they were completely uh, sold mm-hmm. out. Yeah. And there were by the end of that game, there were maybe four other people in our section besides us. Mm-hmm. And one guy was in front of us. Do you remember they used to sell those kind of buffalo hats when William Ramos was playing? Wilson. Right. Wilson. Wilson yeah. Excuse me. Yep. And uh, and there was a guy down in front that had you know resorted to that yeah. because there was literally nothing else warm to buy in any of the shops. Uh, what was the most memorable game you've ever been to? Was it the same one? Well, I mean, my favorite memorable game yeah. was actually the very first game at Nationals Park where Ryan Zimmerman still remains my favorite player uh, hitting a walk-off. Oh, yeah. That was my best memory. And my least favorite was with you, game five <laughs> of the uh, uh, divisional series yeah. against the Cardinals. Yeah. The Jason Worth walk-off during the playoffs was a pretty good game, too. Yeah. Yeah. So my favorite game was uh, game one 
of the World Series when the Chicago White Sox um, beat the uh, Houston Astros. And I, it was a favorite game for me because I was able, I was working uh, for the Motion Picture Association at the time, and I was able to purloin, or get a bunch of tickets for my family. And I went to this game, and it's the World Series, and I was able to get my, my family these tickets. The White Sox won. And also my w- wife, Carrie, who you all know, she was pregnant with Jack, so Jack was at that game. So it's <laughs> always some great stuff. Um, you know, I think about uh, the baseball in the context of, of the long game. I think of it in the context of uh, how it brings people together. Like you said, John, the context you, it gives you something to talk about, probably the greatest conversation topic, that and the weather. And, <laughs> True. Know, and then True. when it's connected, the weather. And, that, yeah. um, and it's also – and, yeah. and, and, and Gail, you used to work at the Motion Picture Association, so I'm going to ask you one last question about baseball. And that is, uh, what is your favorite baseball movie? Mm, I really love Bull Durham. Um, this is, and this is a really fun question. We've actually been asking people on the Library of Congress Twitter account for the past nine weeks some fun baseball questions, and one of them was that one. But I just love that scene where they're all in the middle of on home plate talking to the pitcher and talking about what to get for a wedding gift mm-hmm. and talking about the, you know, the, the. Was it the chicken yeah, foot the chicken. that they're like, yeah. I, I don't know. It was need just, a live chicken to sacrifice. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And it's just is such a mm-hmm. great, it's yeah. just such a great baseball movie. But there are so many really wonderful ones. Meg, what's your favorite baseball movie? Yeah, I, I it, it's Bull Durham. Although I do, I mean, I love Field of Dreams. And I mean, there's so many good ones, but it's, it's definitely Bull Durham. John? No. Oh. A League of Their Own. I have three daughters, remember? Oh, that's true. And But A League of Their Own is with um, Madonna's in mm-hmm. it. And, uh, uh, Tom Hanks. Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell. Yeah, yeah, Tom Hanks. Right. And uh, Gina Davis mm-hmm. is in as well. She's obviously one of the leads. But uh, I, just, I just found it hilarious and well done and, and great, well cast. We so, actually have Dottie's um, Rockford Peaches uniform. Do you? At the library for this exhibit. Yes, Excellent. we sure do. Nice job, Gail. Um, my favorite baseball movie, and the one I can't wait my, for my – actually, my son's already watched it, which is really inappropriate, um, is Bad News Bears. Um, it is – we were watching some clips that we were going to try to get on the show today, but they were so raunchy that we couldn't <laughs> quite do it. But I remember when I played Little League, um, and my – when I was in seventh grade, and our team won the championship, and our coach was a drunk, and he would – take us to batting cages with beers in his hand and um when we won the championship um and it was it was a great game and we it was i still remember it, it was just a lot of fun and um he said to the assorted people at the end of the at the end of the um game when we were getting our trophies he said this team and i'm gonna say i'm sorry if, if you are don't like you know, Swear words. Uh-oh. Cover your ears. No longer G. He said, this team has been getting a royal fucking from the league the whole season, <laughs> and you came back and what? And he said it with a beer and a cigarette. In his hand. <laughs> and that's the kind of visceral beverage yeah. <laughs> that I have a little league. That, you know, I, I think of these little kids, and they don't understand <laughs> half of what's going on. And so that was one of the great thing, things about Walter Matthau. And, you know, they're watching Little League today. And um, you, you have know, a very talented little leaguer at home. He's in your a house. good little player, yeah. And yes. he doesn't take a direction well, but he's a great, great player. <laughs> for me, at least. Um, and he's a great, great player. Uh, but the parents are so intense about all sports, mm-hmm. but especially about baseball. And I will say, uh, John Easton, that um, you're a great coach. And you spend a lot of time coaching uh, softball. As and, do you. And with baseball. More, more power to you because, you know, baseball, coaching's hard because kids don't listen to you. Anyway, so we're going to end on, on this thing. Um, we all have a segment here, and I haven't prepared you for it, but oh, I, I want you to so think nervous. about it. It's, it's, <laughs> what are you buying or selling today? And as, I, as typically happens, I usually start with John Easton. So I'm going to start with John Easton. What are you buying or selling today? And I, and I know that uh, – you all are used to uh, a buy and a sell, but I only have a buy today, so I apologize. And it is, this is not my alma mater. This is actually our rival, but the Oregon State Beavers. I am buying Oregon State Beavers baseball today because they are in the College World Series final. They, uh, last night, were one out away from losing it all. It would have been over. It had the um, Arkansas Razorbacks caught a fairly routine uh, foul fly ball. 
but they didn't. Three of them were confused. It dropped, and the next um, at bat, they uh, single and then a two-run home run, and they ended up winning the game. And it, the final is tonight. They've got all the momentum. I think they're going to probably take it, and they will. They will uh, get another world uh, college World Series championship. So uh, our friend Lindsey Slater went to Oregon State. Lindsey Slater usually goes to bed at like nine o'clock because he gets up at four thirty in the morning. Uh, he stayed up till eleven to watch this. So really good buy, John. Good job, really good. Meg, what are you buying or selling today? Uh, well, I am actually buying the Nets summer camp. Um, my nephew Jackson went for a week and loved every second of it. Um, got to meet Sammy Solis and mm. uh, through through catches with him. Sammy Solis asked him if he wanted it wanted him to throw um, soft or hard to him. Jackson chose hard and was really pleased with himself. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure Sammy Solis's hard throw to Jackson was about 20 miles an hour. Right, right. But Jackson felt like he got it. He caught a 107 mile an hour <laughs> fastball. Great. But they also they didn't just teach these kids baseball. They had a lesson of the day. And every day it was things like just play the game, dwell on the solution, you know. And so they really got, got these kids to focus on life things beyond baseball, and I was really impressed. That's awesome. Uh, that is wonderful. Gail, what are you buying or selling today? Hmm. Well, I think um, I'm, this is maybe a little more um, like an individual. Does that count? You can buy or sell segment? anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am buying – Washington Nationals closing pitcher Sean Doolittle. Um, he has really been a great, great addition to this team. I, because we we talked about, I didn't have a professional hometown team growing up, and I decided when I was very young that I was going to be a Yankee fan. And so, for a long, long time, I was a huge fan of Mariano Rivera, probably mm. the greatest closer ever yep. in the game of baseball. And it's just been really fun to see the Nationals have such a great closer. And I'm also a little partial because Sean was going to join us um, at the opening of our exhibition and was really going to take extraordinary measures to be there. He and his wife are very engaged in educational and literacy programs. They're fans of libraries, and they wanted to come out and support us, and their travel schedule ended up not letting them be there, yeah. but um, we really appreciated his um, commitment to trying to, to be with us, and I just think that he is um, a great player and is going to be a great part of the Washington community for some years to come. Legitimate closer. Yeah. Do yeah. the do. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that. So I'm going to just buy and sell uh, by uh, Washington Nationals fans and the, how it's really energized the entire community uh, and how they do a really good job of outreach with the, the Nationals themselves. But the fans, you know, the, in Washington, we don't agree on much. Uh, we have lots of protests. We have lots of, you know, um, disagreements on a bunch of things. But to John Easton's point, the one thing I can talk to friends who I know I disagree with on politics, we have a safe space with the Washington Nationals. And I love the fans because they're, you know, typically very well behaved and very family friendly and nice people. So here's to the Washington Nationals. And I am out of my Guinness. And that means we're at the end of the show. Thank you so much, uh, Gail and Meg, for joining us at the Fury Theory Podcast. It's been so much fun to have you, and we hope to have you again. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. We'd love to come back. That yes, would be would. awesome. Cheers. 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 Cheers.